Bless you guys. Yay for Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Come on, let's grab a seat and roll with this thing. Woohoo! We're not going to, we really won't stay super long. I won't be really any later than you normally are on a Sunday. That won't limit God at all. My view of a Sunday morning is just this corporate gathering. It's synergistic. It's corporate celebration. It's worship. It's all together, just acknowledging the glory and beauty of who he is, right? Looking around the room, realizing you're not the only one believing what you're believing. And it's just an encouraging time, right? So you hear what the Lord's saying and boom, we roll on and look a little more like him when we go. And that's really the goal on a Sunday morning to me. So I've pastored for a while before I started traveling and, and I was never really long on a Sunday morning. I felt like it was just a good celebration time to come and look a little more like him when we leave. So now last night I preached a long time because that's a special service. And, <laughs> and if you got done before me, you could have slipped out. <laughs> We're going to receive communion, obviously. Uh, very special to my heart, the revelation behind communion. Uh, Pastor Kurt mentioned last night about God and the disappointment factor thing that he talked about. I'm not going to get into that, but he mentioned another comment in the same light that he served an angry God, etc. I want you to think about something that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. There's no place in the Bible that says the reprimand of God leads a man to change. I was talking to one of your leaders yesterday. He said he was reprimanding one of his children. And right in the moment, the Lord said, hey, if I reprimanded you that way, would it draw you farther away from me or closer? Amen. And they said, wow, farther away. He said, that's what you'll do to your child. There's some preachers that are afraid to preach the love of God because they have this belief that it will empower people to stay the same. It's the total opposite. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm changed in my life. You don't live with me. You just see me on weekends. I live with me. I actually like me now. <laughs> Do you know how many people don't like themselves? Do you know how many people need people to like them to think they're likable? That they're weighing their value based on the response of others instead of the cross and the finished work and God saying, I love you through his son. It changed me. Like, he loves me. Like he saw my value when I had none. He knew my destiny when I couldn't see tomorrow. And on my darkest day, he didn't lose sight of what he created me for and created me to be. And his love never failed. That makes me happy. And you know what it does? It restores you diligence and integrity and all the things that were lost through sin, it puts all those things back into your life. I didn't find a way to sin and get away with it. I found a way to be free, to not be driven by the flesh and to live by the Spirit and to be one with Him. That sounds like good news to me. So I'm not preaching some greasy grace thing, something that just says, oh, it's okay. God just loves you anyway. He always loves us, but he wants us transformed. And it's not works, and it's not law, and it's not legalism. It's the goodness of God. When you start seeing the value that he possesses towards your life to the tune of the blood of his son, you'll start living up to that level. When a person has a low esteem, when a person has a crushed identity, when a person doesn't value themselves, they live up to the low level in which they see themselves. It's where almost every addictive cycle is rooted is a lack of identity and a low esteem towards an individual. When you don't see yourself worthy, you won't live worthy. When you think you're less than, you'll live less than. And if you make a tree good and tell a person who they really are, See, making a tree good or making a tree bad has to do with identity. It doesn't have to do with works. It doesn't mean try harder, get it straight. It means become what he paid for. And if you see what he paid for and you make a tree good and you teach people who they are through the cross and through even the truths behind communion, the fruit will be good. It doesn't mean try harder means believe what you've become now that he came. 
There's a big concern about grace on the earth and there's a lot of people that speak out of turn and they mark people as grace preachers and grace movement and grace this and that. And there's a lot of concern out there and it, 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 it concerns my heart that men are speaking out of turn. Men of reputation, men that are reputable and, and men of God that are gifted and then they speak out of turn and, and, and here's the simple truth about it. When you hear a person preaching grace, if the grace isn't leading to transformation, it's perversion. It's just that simple. Grace is the etching tool of God. Grace is God's empowerment. Grace is God's ability to change a life. So if you're preaching grace, it's, it's not a permission slip to stay the same and say, oh, well, he loves me anyway. When you're really preaching grace, it's God changing a person into what he paid for, into what he sees from the beginning. Grace changes you. You're saved by grace through faith. When you see the truth about who God created you to be, grace begins to make that truth your reality when you believe it. And then you are what you are by the grace of God. We beheld him in grace and truth. It's grace for grace. This gospel has always been about grace. Just because somebody preached it in a way that gives permission to stay the same doesn't mean you throw away the package. And let's not swing the pendulum. So people get real liberal and preach a grace that allows you to just live whatever and claim his love. And then this camp sees that and goes, ah, and they tighten their message to pull those over. And the pendulum swings this way. And then they go more liberal and it's just, whoa, whoa. And there's this healthy, beautiful place right here where Jesus is going, hey, guys, <laughs> right here. When we receive communion today, it's going to be an intimate, fun time, and, and we're going to talk about a little bit about some things. I want to share what happened on the cross real quick, and then we'll get some, some fellas up here to help us get this in everybody's hands. I want you to slow down for a minute and just think about this. Jesus came to the earth as a man. He must really value the destiny that he created man to live. That an innocent God, the Son of God, innocent, holy, righteous, pure Son of God would become a man. He, he was put by Holy Spirit into the womb of a woman, guys. Don't get familiar with this. Don't just turn it into a Christmas Easter thing. This is amazing. It's, it's actually, it's the heart of the gospel. It's God became flesh. Why? To redeem flesh. Why does he care about redeeming flesh? Because he knows why we're here and what he made men for. And he never lost sight of that truth and that purpose. Don't let love be a mystery. I can't believe God would love me. That's because you value yourself based on your own lack of performance or your own resume. You're confused that God can love you because you weigh yourself based on yourself. You don't weigh yourself based on your created value and purpose. God knows why he made men. He made men for his image, to cover the earth with his glory. It's simple. God has never changed. No matter man has changed and sin and time has passed by, he still knows why men are on the earth. And he paid the price of his son to redeem that truth in our lives so he once again could live inside of us. Not so he could jot your name down on a roster. but to put himself back inside of us. <laughs> yeah? And live inside of us. He paid a price so we could be one, guys. That's incredible to me. That is far from a Christmas story, a baby in a manger, a suffering Savior on a cross. It's so much more. It's intimate. It's personal. It's God becoming one with man and man becoming one with God. It's covenant. It's co-union, communion. It's all that is mine is yours and all that is yours is mine and two become one. It's really good. And today isn't the day, never was the day, to have an attitude, to be touchy, to be whatever. Well, I don't know if I like that. Well, no, no, no. Today is a day to just fall before him and surrender before him and say, you know what? Man, you know the truth about me, the truth about my life. And man, I said it yesterday, the reason life is a grind to people, the, the reason people are trying to get through life is because they're living life outside of why they're here. There's no grace outside of why you're here. 
That's why it's a dry land. That's why it's a struggle. That's why it's a push and shove. That's why work feels like a grindstone because you don't realize it's a mission field where you shine. And all you can do is complain and wait for another job with more pay to get fuller vats and bigger barns because you're not getting any younger. And all of a sudden you're being driven by something that's not. Man, that's good preaching right there. Just in case you didn't catch it, I just wanted to let you know that is really good preaching in your church right there. Come on! Because those kind of beliefs don't don't produce fruit and life and good things. So it's so simple. This thing is so simple. If what you're believing and what you're thinking isn't producing life, it can't be the truth. If you're just toned down and whatever, and oh, I'm giving by, brother. Well, keep me in prayer, hanging in there, man. Well, we're trying to make it. Ah! (laughs) What is that? That's living outside of truth. That's wrapping no faith around what really is. That's failing to wake up in the morning and taking the time to not just try to wake up and and pull yourself out of bed, but to take the time to realize that today's a gift and you have another day and life is a gift and you have another day to be like him and be one with him and to know him and be loved by him. And you don't just wait for God to come and, and, and wrap you in his love. So many people wait for this big kabang, like, I just can't wait till God manifests his love to me. He already did. He put his son on a cross. That is a manifestation of the love of God. And you put your faith in the I love you from the Lord. Come on, Jesus is hanging there on a cross. That's I love you guys. I know every one of you. I knew you from the beginning. You're worth this price. Pleases me to bruise the sun so I can put my life in you. Don't run from me. Run to me. Don't hide. Come out. Love you. That's the cross. That's what the cross is saying. Don't get familiar with it. Don't let it become church language. Don't get religious. Don't know this whole message and not be changed by it. You say, how do I do that? You get personal with him. You get alone with him. When nobody's in the room, thank you for loving me. Thank you for valuing my life. Thank you for seeing fit Jesus to hang on the cross and suffer for doing no wrong, to take all the wrong I've ever done away. God, thank you that it worked. It's perfectly pure and amazing. It's absolutely happened. His blood, Jesus, is speaking better things over my life, and you see me and value me and love me. I know tons of Christians I've met in my life that never even think that way when they're alone, let alone talk that way to the Lord. (laughs) And it's knowing him not serving him. That will change your life. Serving him won't transform your life. In fact, you'll question if you're serving good enough, long enough, doing enough, and you'll always be in question and quandary. But knowing him is transforming. Knowing him is the change of our lives. Communion has everything to do with initiating that relationship. It's a good springboard. It's a good It's a good contact point of faith. Communion is an amazing tool, if you will, given by God to activate your heart toward him. I've had countless people, if I'd take a show of hands and you were actually honest this morning, there's people that make the attempt to get along with God and commune with God, but their flesh kicks in. It doesn't feel real. He feels far away, feels mechanical, doesn't seem like anything's happening. I've heard all that and then some. So then they pull out of that place and just reserve to their prayer list and pray about stuff and people and things instead of communion and love and yay. (laughs) Yeah? Am I making sense? And they say, yeah, but when I get there, I just freeze up and I don't know what to say and I don't have any words and there I am, I'm sitting on the bed and I'm like, okay, well, I'm here. And I think we're just waiting for this love bubble to come around us and just... It's not like that. It can be, but it's not even healthy if that would come before faith and belief. Because if that would come before belief, then you always need the bubble. And then you look at people that look like they're in the bubble and you want to get around them and hope you brush against them and maybe they'll pray for you and ooh. The bubble. (sighs) Preaching good, ain't I? 
That's not our goal. Our goal is to know him. It's the knowings. Paul writes about knowing this and knowing this. And we know this and knowing this. It's an intimate, revelatory word that's from the heart. The knowings of God. If you don't spend time in the love of God, communing with God, believing his love, declaring his love, talking to him when nobody else is in the room, and saying and believing that he loves you and values you, how will you ever get the knowing of your value settled in your heart? That's why looks bother us, and that's why people affairs move us and manipulate us, and that's why many good people live this way. Because life is speaking louder than truth. But yet truth is what makes you free. There's something about knowing him. Jesus didn't say eternal life is a prayer that sends you to heaven. He said this is eternal life. Amen. Oh, it's there. It's John 17, 3. I read it. It's there. It says this is eternal life. Amen. That you might know him. Amen. Knowing him is eternal life. Him? Who's him? The only true God and his son, Jesus Christ. Whew. There's some about waking up in the morning instead of going, oh my God, you're going to have to help me today. <laughs> that isn't prayer. That's a self-centered, self-focused, deceived complaint session that sounds spiritual because you mentioned the Lord in it. <laughs> Six o'clock already? Are you kidding me? Six o'clock? What? God, I'm going to need you. That's not prayer. Stop. Like, why did I have to pee at 3.30 and then I couldn't go back to bed till 4? You know I'm going to be tired. One night, just one night, I would love to touch faith so good that you would just let me sleep all night. I know what people do. They wake up so self-conscious and then they turn their self-consciousness into a complaint session that they call prayer. Well, you're going to have to empower me to get to work today because I don't know. And that boss, I don't know why you let him do that to me. If I'm in covenant with you and you love me, I would think you'd just one of these days knock him off his high horse. <laughs> when the whole goal of your life is to love him and to shine and to be thankful and to be merciful and be a peacemaker and walk in the light as Jesus is in the light. I promise you, God the Father's not our busboy or our table waiter. He's not the one that makes your day work the way you hope. He's the one that lives in you and shines through you and loves like he loves. Yeah? There's something about being thankful. There's something about wrapping faith around your day. Waking up in the morning and yes, your body's tired. And man, you could use an extra hour. But it's time to get up because you got a work schedule. And you're a whatever to whatever time frame. And you're committed and you got to punch in your cart. You can't lay there. Oh, your body wants another hour. But your heart starts getting bigger than your body. And Father, I just thank you for the gift of life today. Man, you know, right now I could just lay in this bed for another hour, but you know what? And you roll over and you sit up in bed. I just honor you and worship you and thank you for the grace of life. And all of a sudden, you start wrapping purpose around your day and you thank God he loves you. And Holy Spirit, I so appreciate that you're in me and with me. And all of a sudden, you're communing with him. And you might finally make it to the bathroom and instead of going, ugh, you go, man, you are really growing with God, and I just thank you, God, for what I see in the eyes of that person right there. Man, that is righteousness being revealed. You love them, God. Wow, dude, you're amazing. <laughs> People say, well, you're boasting in men. You're making men something. No, no, no. I'm boasting in God in men. I'm boasting in the truth of the beginning. Let us make man in our image. He wants to live in you and live through you. If you don't recognize who he is in your life, come on, it's not vanity. How will you ever walk in truth? Let's stop boasting in this false humility thing and think we always have to talk ourselves so far down as if to lift him up. You're supposed to acknowledge every good thing you have in him. You're supposed to believe the truth. He's the one. He's the one that made you one with him. He's the one that seated you in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He's the one that paid a price to live inside of you. You probably ought to be okay with it. Look, I'm just, I got over it a long time ago. I'm not trying to offend you or frustrate you or sound self-righteous. He absolutely loves me. Why? How do you know that, Dan? Because your life works and goes good? No, because Jesus came and died on the cross, period. That's my starting point. That's, that's, that's where love is rooted and grounded and proven. He came. I know people that say, well, the car broke down this week and I got laid off and my wife's acting crazy. I thought God loved me. 
God's love is not questioned by your circumstances. It's established through the cross. Come on, if love's not established through the cross, how will you ever walk in faith when faith worketh through love? You're to be rooted and grounded in love. How are you rooted and grounded if life has the ability to question what's settled? So this communion today is a personal contact point. I believe Jesus said this. He said, as often as you do it, you don't need lead in a church service. You don't need Pastor Kurt or Pastor Dan, or Pastor Adam or anybody to lead it. You let your own heart lead it. Amen. You can do it in your bedroom. I, people, get, people get funny. They we get so religious we don't realize it. We do just what the Pharisees did. They listened to Jesus to hear what they didn't agree with and got mad. I, I was preaching at kingdom school once. That you could be sitting eating a bowl of Cheerios ready to go to work. And you could just look at the Cheerio floating on your... For some reason, that's offensive to religion. Because religion loves you to do the form of everything so perfect, but not be changed. To put all your pride in what you do instead of your heart in what you become. It's legalistic and it stinks before the Lord. How's that? I've never said that on tape. It stinks before the Lord. Religion. Wretched. You could look down at that Cheerio on your bowl, on your spoon, and you could just remember. It's just all of a sudden, you just you take it off your spoon. Lord Jesus, right now, I'm just remembering your death and what you did for me. You take that one little Cheerio before it's too soggy, and you just... You just it just drives religion crazy, but... But I'll tell you what, it'll do so much good for your heart because at your, at your breakfast table and you're the only one sitting there ready to go to work, you're doing that, you're either one of two things. You're either deceived, deluded, and you ought to get a hobby or God's real and he's changing your life. Amen. It's one or the other. It's one or the other. You take time to go in your bedroom and sit in your bed and talk to the Lord. You're either talking to the walls in the air and you ought to learn to fly a kite or go fish or something. Or he's real. And he's in that room. And if you stay there and stay faithful to be in there and you seek him, he'll see you there and you'll find him. And it's not that he was hiding. It's that he awakens and opens up your heart with knowings. Like people look at me, they see my passion. They see my problem is the knowings in my life. If I have a problem, that's my problem. Everything I'm telling you is my truth. Don't be afraid you'll get like me. <laughs> You're not comparing me. Just be the best you. You take that little cheerio. You're just sitting at your, at your breakfast table. You only got 10 minutes. You got to get in the car. You got a work schedule. You snap that thing. Lord Jesus, thank you. And you died. And you gave your life that I might have life. I got this little window called life. I'm not going to miss this thing. It's before me. You have opened my heart. Continue to open my heart. Holy Spirit, I so welcome you. Lord Jesus, you paid for my redemption, my restoration, for God to live inside of me by his spirit. I just thank you for the body you gave. I just thank you for every scar, every mark, every bruise, every drop of blood. I receive your love today. And thank you for empowering me to look like you, shine like you, think like you, and be like you. Holy Spirit, I welcome you. You take that spoon and it's milk and it's white. But it's a contact point. And Lord Jesus, that blood that ran down your body. I just thank you. My blood for your blood. My life for your life. I give myself to you. Thank you that I'm clean before the throne. It would do so many Christians so much good to do this. Thank you, Father, when you're looking down at me, you see me holy, blameless, and above reproach, and I'm going to keep believing it, and it's going to keep producing the fruit of holiness, Romans 6. I'm not going to stop trying to be holy. That's a dead-end street. I'm going to believe I'm righteous, and righteousness alone will produce fruit in my life that looks more like you. Thank you for empowering me to live this thing. That's breakfast. <laughs> That's breakfast. You following me? It's a contact point of faith. There was a season in my life where Holy Spirit said, I want you to receive communion every morning. Just receive it every day, every morning, every day. And it was pretty much in the morning is when I was doing it. And it was for several months. 
I had a pastoral schedule. I had office hours. It was getting sketchy, man. I'd be 45 minutes in, and I'm still holding the bread and the cup. And I still didn't take the bread because my heart is just exploding with everything the flesh paid for, everything the body of Jesus accomplished. Scriptures are running through my mind, and I'm communing them with the Lord, and the knowings in my heart are going like this because I'm remembering. I'm remembering. It's contact point of faith. You take that, it actually puts words in your heart, words in your mouth. All of a sudden, you're not stalemated, self-conscious, sitting on your bed wondering where I'm going to go here now. Because it gets weird for people. They're like, well, I just don't know what to pray. I get alone and I just... Trouble is, we get feeling self-conscious. Sometimes we take 10, 20 minutes to get past ourselves to think we can approach him. You come through the blood. You come sincere. But I'll tell you what, you take a communion elements, it's automatic conversation. Lord Jesus, this represents everything you've done. Holy Spirit, I thank you for quickening me and bringing all the scriptures that I've ever read concerning this truth to my understanding. Man, I want the knowings in my life to be built and to be solely built in you. And all of a sudden, you're holding that bread and you're talking to him and you're thanking him for the cross, thanking him for being totally innocent and not changing his mind for love that never failed. And all of a sudden, the qualities that make him Lord, that make us love him, you start realizing are the qualities he called you to. And all of a sudden, you realize he paid a price for you to be the body of Christ. Why isn't this taught like crazy, right? The expression of Christ. He paid for you to express him. Not sing to him. Not pray when you're driven in need. To express him. How are you going to do that? By being filled with the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. By being one with him. By knowing and confident that he lives in you. And he'll never leave you alone or forsake you. And he's as close as the mention of his name. Yeah. The more you see how he sees you, the more you'll see yourself in truth. And then what happens is you look through your eyes and see everybody else in that same truth. That's why it's so easy to love. I don't know most of your names, but I know your value. I know the price he paid. I am sure not sacrificing right now. I'm not doing the preaching thing. I'm not nervous and I'm not running out of time and I'm not running out of words. I'm looking at you guys and going, this is so easy. I know who you are. Maybe more than you know who you are. Some of you. Just so. I know there's a time to be born and here you sit. I know life comes from God and he's the author and giver of life. I know that no matter where you've been and no matter what you've done, his mind isn't changed about you. And he paid a price to redeem your purpose, your destiny, so you could write legacy and stand before him someday and be honored and glad that you could believe. <laughs> I know that about every person I ever run into. That's why people don't bother me and get under my skin. I got new skin. <laughs> well, they just get on my nerves. Well, I bet they don't get on God's nerves. You ought to question that phrase. Well, they just bother me. I just stay away from them. They just kind of wig me out. Well, they probably don't wig God out. I'd probably look at that and be concerned. You learned that stuff through Adam, not through Jesus. You learned that stuff through self-centered, self-conscious flesh. Pride and preferences and presumption and comparisons and first impressions. I wonder if you walk in a room and just start seeing the truth about everybody. I wonder if the people that are farther from the truth are the people that you feel a heart for more and mercy rises up and you actually gravitate to instead of run from. I bet you that's Jesus, huh? He got a little hit hard and critiqued by the leaders of the day for the people he hung around. Why do you think he hung around those people? Oh, Because oh. he knew who they were when they didn't have a clue. He knew what they were created for and called to, and they didn't have a clue. And he gravitated to them, and he hung around them. He said, the, 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 the people that are well don't need a physician. It's the sick. They're like, why are you hanging out in their house? Where else would I be? <laughs> Ain't that something? If I could have the team that's going to help me do this, 
This would be amazing. I'm going to talk a little about this communion. As they're getting ready, just, just listen up. They'll come to you in a minute. Don't be distracted by them getting ready. They're, just, this is just, they're, they're going to do a great job, I can tell. They're, they're a unit. We appreciate you guys. They got like 16 of them, man. It's going to be a done deal. <laughs> thank you, God. Father, we thank you that today is full of revelation. We thank you that today is full of understanding. More than that, I pray, personally pray, and I know the leaders and, and many people would say yes to this. We pray for a revelation, a deeper revelation of knowing you, of your personal, intimate love in a way that would empower every one of our lives to shine a little more, love a little more, and to be a little more like you. Let this tool called communion, let this contact point of faith come alive in our hearts and let us find ourselves remembering you until that day when you come. In Jesus' name, amen? amen. Go ahead, guys, do what you gotta do. Is it okay if I talk while they're handing that out, Pastor? Listen, I want you to understand something before this all comes to you and we do this. When Jesus hung on the cross, you have to understand that God didn't curse his son on the cross. God made his son to be sin. What God cursed on the cross was sin. He cursed sin in the flesh. Your Bible teaches you that. He destroyed sin in the power of it. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Anything hanging on a pole has been cursed by God. He who knew no sin was made to be sin. So he literally was made to be like us. So we could be empowered to be like him. You have to understand many things about this. Like, like I shared this, I'm sure I shared this when I was here before. I shared a lot. It's powerful. Jesus was beat beyond description. When they beat him, guys, they didn't just do 40 minus one stripes. And they didn't just put stakes in his hands and his feet. They beat him and pummeled him and whipped him and smacked him. In the Passion movie is probably only about halfway there. Did you ever see the passion? You say, how do you know it was only halfway there? Because of the Bible. The Bible says he was marred more than any of the sons of men. That means when they were finished with Jesus, his, he was so disfigured, his flesh was so mauled that he was marred more than anyone ever was at the hands of a man. Marred more than any of the sons of men. That means when they were done with Jesus, his appearance surpassed the worst that ever was. <clears throat> you know how when people would be called witches in those days and stuff, and they'd say they were practicing sorcery and stuff, they'd just tie them to a stake and burn them. They'd put a bunch of wood down and just burn them on a stake, right? You burn a person on a stake, and then the fire goes out. You tell me if you can tell who they are. You tell me if you could tell if they're even a male or female. He was marred more than anybody ever. So would it be safe to say that when they were done beating him, you couldn't possibly tell who he was and what he looked like? Would it be fair to say that when they were done beating him, that you couldn't even tell if he was a male or a female? Because he was so disfigured, marred more than any. Watch. There's a reason for all this. It's all tied up in the cross. It's like his body, he was, who knows that he got separated from God when he was hanging there? Do you know that's in scripture? Why did he get separated? It's a parallel to pay the price for you to forever be joined. Why did he die? So you never will. Oh my goodness. Like I'm never going to die. He said, I'll shoot you in the chest with a nine millimeter. You're going to die. You're wrong. I'm never going to die. Yay. So why do we fear death? Because we live sentimental and we're living for now instead of living for him. That's why we fear death. They marred Jesus more than any of the sons of men. Why? When sin got done in the garden with Adam, when sin got finished with Adam, when he gave himself to sin and he did the voice of his wife instead of God's. Watch this. Here's a man that was made for God's image who was walking in absolute love and living in the spirit to a T. He was a son. When sin got done with him, he didn't look anything like he was created to be. He completely lost his appearance and his image. 
So Jesus came and lost his appearance to parallel and pay the price to get our identity back and to be restored back to the beginning. There's no selfishness in love. There's no love in selfishness. They don't agree. God made man in his image and God is love. God made man to love. When man got cut off from the source of love and sin separated him from God, he got cut off from love. God still loves him, but he got cut off from love and became in need of love. You and I were born into that, the need of love. It's driven us, guys. You're created to love, and we've reduced to needing it instead of being it. And then if we're not careful, we preach a gospel where it's just God loves you, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. Who knows I'm not being sarcastic and making fun of God loving us. It's a key. But we make it all about God loving you and never transition into becoming that same thing. The goal of the cross is not you being loved by God. The goal of the cross is you becoming the love of God to where once again man is found in his image. You put off the old, you put on the new. He's renewed in knowledge according to the image, Colossians 3.10, of the very one who made him. Don't you get so, so far removed from this truth that you just follow our flesh and follow our experiences and all of a sudden we're following one another. Oh, well, that was God. This is us. Hey, brother, we'll never be perfect. And all that stuff we say. <sighs> Not even talking about perfect. Talk about love. Don't tell me you can't walk in love. Don't tell me you can't deny yourself and follow him. Don't tell me you can't not love your own life unto death because the scriptures call us to it. Isn't that awesome? So man got cut off and became in need of love. Jesus comes, becomes what we were so we could become what he is. And all of a sudden, we're filled with the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, and we're back in the beginning as if God and man were never separated, as if man never sinned, because the blood speaking better things, holy, blameless, and above reproach. How could the Bible say you're holy, blameless, and above reproach if there's any trace of wrongdoing between you and God? He has such a clear view of you through the cross. He sees you through the righteous blood of his son, and it makes you righteous. He rules his kingdom with the scepter of righteousness. And every man that comes and bows before him, he knights you with righteousness, and he says, stand before me and be right. Whew. Not because you did right, because you believe right, and he did right. And all of a sudden, it puts a new, fresh integrity, a new desire. And all of a sudden, the goodness of God is leading your heart to change. Yeah? It's the covenant I have with him. It's the relationship that I have with him that empowers my life to live this way. I'm not trying not to sin. I'm enjoying being his. There's a big difference. I'm not waking up to do right. I'm waking up made right. Amen. Yeah. Yeah? And this that we're about to partake of right now. Oh, we're so on time too. I told you I would be a good boy today. <laughs> Your pastor's trying to get me to go late. No. <laughs> He's whispering over, don't, it don't matter when you get done. If it's in your heart, you says, no, we're getting out of here. Stop it. Get thee behind me, Kurt. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> he loves me. He's giving me so much freedom. Now, don't, don't, don't cut this short. I'm like, I'm cutting it short. I'm having fun. I just threw him under the bus, didn't I? Did I? No, no. <laughs> he's excited. It's because he's a man of God, and he likes me. And we're sitting there, and he's like, go for it, man. Don't worry about the time. But, but I never really go late on a Sunday on purpose. And Holy Spirit doesn't mind. It's not religion. Amen. Take this little whatever this is. <laughs> this is different. This is different. This is, this is to promote faith, right? <laughs> the body of Jesus. He's a bent-up wafer. Jesus has become a bent-up wafer. <laughs> I'm having fun with you. It's a contact point of faith. Pastor's wife is mouthing to me, it's really good. It's really good. Really good. 
I almost ate it. She's like, Rebecca. <laughs> whoa, whoa. <laughs> so here's what I want you to do. Obviously, we're all in a room and we're all together and we're laughing and we're having fun. But picture yourself all alone and how powerful this would be when you're just alone and nobody in the room. That's powerful, guys. And I'm just going to paint a little picture and then we're going to do this together. But I want you to do it from your heart. But I'm just going to paint a little picture right now. Just picture being all alone, sitting on your bed, just at the kitchen table. You just hugged your spouse and said, hey, I'm just going to slip off to the room. And they know what that means because you've been slipping off to the room. And it's a good thing. It's not like I wonder what they're doing in there and I wonder what computer button they're hitting and all that stuff that's happened in marriages. It's actually all of a sudden you just want to go be with them. When this stuff got real in my life that I'm talking about, you know what I would do? I would close my bedroom door when I came out. Never do that. It's open. It was open when I left yesterday. I would leave it open all the time. But when I got saved to get this understanding, it was a contact point, I just closed my door. Why? It's not a deep thing. I had to open it to go back in. Why does that matter? Because I was going back in to meet with him. Amen. And I liked the door being closed. Because <laughs> then I would sneak up there and I'd look. And I'd sneak in there. And I'd close it and say, Hey, it's me. I'd leave the light off. It's me. I just came to be with you. I just came to talk with you. Oh, my goodness. I'm either out of my mind right now, or he's real and he's going to meet me. I'm telling you, four or five days into that, the knowings in my life were undescribable. Now, don't you put a time limit on God and don't just say, well, what happened for Dan in four or five days? Stop. It's faith. I'm talking about faith. If he never put the knowings in me, I still want to go be with him. I'm still going to go commune. And go. But the knowings came. Why? Because faith was there and I'm going to meet with him. And I could have been doing a hundred other things that might not have even been sin, right? But I want to be with him and I want to get to know him. And I'm like a little boy that honors his daddy and wants to be just like his daddy. And daddy's his hero and can't do any wrong. But in this case... I really do have that daddy. Amen. Amen. I don't grow up to be 15 and think, why did I used to dig my dad like that? He's kind of nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that happens to people. And then dad's drawing his identity from his relationship with his son. His son's changing, and now they're all crashing and burning. Why? Because this might be missing. You don't live from one another. You live from him. I need you to lock arms with me so we can have impact and cover the earth with his glory. I need you to run with me to have greater impact, but I never need you to know who I am and to be secure. Because if I need you to know who I am, I'm only as good as you see me. And I'm going to stay insecure and I'll be as strong as the weakness that surrounds me. He doesn't change, people change. People go to a church and think the pastor's amazing, and six months later they say, you know, I'm not sure. Something's changed with him. I think we ought to look for another church. And people church shop, and then pastors and leaders try to market a better product. <sighs> We're not trying to do church. We're becoming her. And if what you do called church isn't empowering you to become her, we're way deceived. If all your lights and smoke and all your powerful sounds and tunes and blasting instruments aren't producing Christ in your life and you're looking more like him when you wake up, we're probably playing church instead of being her. And we're probably letting a lot of things take the place of knowing him. Yeah? So have the best you can have, but make sure the point and the reason why is, is this. I love what you have up here. I love what you got going on. I really do. I mention it every time I'm here. I say, man, you got a full, man, this is full blown. Make sure it's always for this reason. That we leave here inspired to look a little more like him than when we came. Amen. That in our own homes, we're going to be peacemakers. Not fight over where we're going to eat today. And have animosity in the car. Not receive communion and then just live the way we've lived. Come on. I want change. 
I don't have to agree with you to love you. And it takes two to tango. It takes one to pursue peace. So make sure you're that one. Especially in a household, in a home where there's children and parents and siblings of different ages. You be an example. Parents, don't let your children, quote, get on your nerves and how to get, you don't want to listen to me either, this and that. Don't, don't let your heart shift on why you're here on the planet. And even if there's animosity and even if your children are doing things out of control, make sure as they grow older, when they look at you and think of you deep in their heart, all they know is you've looked like him. And if you've missed that in any way, make peace on it immediately. Say, you know what? I know I got a little intense a while ago and I was a little frustrated. I'm admitting I never want to touch you that way, sweetie. Son, I never want to. And you weep and you hold them and you make sure they see the power and beauty and sincerity of repentance. Because it's never about failing. It's always about becoming. You don't hear a preacher say, well, then I blew it. No, no, no. We only blow it if we stay that way when we know it's not producing life. I think our children need to see the humility of repentance. Children, if you have a parent that doesn't get it and live it, or they go to church and sing and raise both hands, but they bash you with their words and you watch them slam your other parent with their words, don't you let what they don't see define what you do. You be a living example and epistle. You get in your bedroom and you grow in Christ and you shine in the midst of that. Don't let your heart get hard. Don't you judge them. Don't you say, well, they take me to church. It makes me so mad. They're such a hypocrite. Don't you let their hypocrisy harden your heart. Come on, guys. We have sold cheap so many times. And when I read my Bible, we're not for sale. (laughs) You're already bought with a price and you're not your own. So you might want to, after today, consider getting a loan and you can pull off a piece of bread. You can buy this cool stuff if you want. <laughs> you can take a Cheerio out of the bowl. Honestly, I honestly don't think Jesus cares at all. What matters is that as often as you do it, you do it in remembrance of me till I come. He says, in my death till I come. What's the point? To keep you focused in what it's all about so you don't let life speak louder than truth. He tells you to set your mind on things above. Why? Because your mind wants to go on tilt and go other places that don't matter. Yeah? So on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. It's fascinating. On the night he was betrayed, his idea of responding was to give his life, not say, I can't believe you're betraying me. You got to make sure on the night you're betrayed, you're not just crying and calling a friend and asking for prayer. Make sure you're following Jesus, not just using him for a better day. Because on the night he was betrayed, his idea of responding was laying down his life. When he rose from the dead, he said to Mary, go tell my brother. And he didn't say, go tell my two face backstabbing cowards. He said, go tell my brother. And you know what he's saying? I haven't changed my mind about you. They sat at the table and said, we'll die for you. And he said, no, I'm going to be struck and you're going to scatter. And they said, no, we'll die for you. And amongst themselves, they all convinced one another, will die for him. He knew they wouldn't on the night he's betrayed. Come on, that's a hurting minister in today's Christian world. Well, I laid down my life for the last three years and gave myself thick and thin and stayed up for hours praying and I watched over them and I manifested the gospel and bore signs and witnesses of the gospel of power and signs and, and there's nothing I've lacked or failed to do and these guys want to run out on me as soon as it gets tight. You can't trust nobody. They said, they're for me. John laid his head on me all the time, said, I love you. Oh, John, get off of me. <laughs> on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And 
And he didn't let what men didn't see and who men weren't decide who he was. And he continued to say, when you see me, you're seeing him. What an honor, people. God made us for this. This thing isn't a prayer that takes you to heaven. It puts heaven back into you and reestablishes why we're all here. And I don't want the wisdom before him to be my wisdom now. Because it wasn't ever producing life. I don't need a right to be less than him. I have a reason for being like him. So on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he passed it around. When you take this bread in your personal life, even today, I want you to think of the things that come to mind that his body accomplished. In 1 John 4, 1, it says, any spirit that doesn't acknowledge Jesus coming in the flesh isn't from the Lord. That's strange. Why isn't it any spirit that doesn't acknowledge Jesus as Lord? Or something else. Why is it a spirit that doesn't acknowledge Jesus coming as a man? Why is that the sign of an antichrist spirit? Because the spirit doesn't want you to know what his flesh accomplished. I am right with God. Like I have oneness with God. His life is inside of me because of this right here. Like I have access to heaven. I see that I have Jesus, the son of God. He's a high priest forever. He's passed through the heavens. And I come boldly to the throne of grace. So you want to look and you want to go, you know what? Man, you were whipped and beat. You were broken on that cross so that I could be restored, redeemed, healed, delivered, and unbeatable. Man, you showed me humility and integrity. You suffered as a wrongdoer. You hung there. They had to strip you naked. They had to try to totally diminish you and mock you and make you look so insignificant. And you didn't say a word. You did it because you saw the other side and the joy set before you and the fruit of what you were doing. You knew that one day I could stand here and have total unveiled face to God and be right in the sight of our Father because of the sacrifice you made. I love you. I honor you. And I thank you for what you did in your body for me. See, it's personal, guys. You look at this bread and you start thinking, Man, they were one from the beginning, whatever that means. You look up the word the beginning in Hebrew and it just means back and back and back till there is no beginning. But in the beginning, whatever that is, he was there, one with the Father from the beginning. And now on the cross, he separates from the Father. The Father pulls back and separates because that's what happened through sin to us. So he literally became like us and was apart from God. Why? So you and me, you and I could forever be joined and be one and never live separate again. Ah! If he didn't want that, why would he pay for that? Oh! So you look at this and you think of these things and you go, oh my goodness. You were beat beyond description and unrecognizable. Kind of like this thing. <laughs> and, and you did it so I could get my identity back and so that I could look like I was created to look and see like Cherise says, you know, it's good. You taste and see the Lord's good. Like, yeah? So when you're receiving communion, Don't ever just do it as an ordinance. Don't do it in works. Don't just do it because there's a little sign in and you feel accomplished because you received communion. It's full of truth. It's full of, it's full of exchange. It's, it's full of, and you have to let those things become real in your own heart. Search out the scripture. Ask Holy Spirit to show you everything that this body paid for. Amen? Let's just do this together right now. You take that and you look at that and from your heart, you thank him for something that you're beginning to understand right now. Like understanding that God forever wants you to be joined to him. That he was willing to put everything you ever were and ever did on his own son so you could become his own son. 
And then in his master plan on the third day, he raised Jesus from the dead according to the spirit of holiness. Is that too cool or what? Hell had to freak out, man. They're like, what? We thought we won. Are you kidding? You made a big mistake, pal. (laughs) You crucified the Son of God, shed innocent blood, and now his blood is speaking better things over a guilty humanity, and they're coming out of darkness into the light by the thousands. (laughs) Yay. (laughs) You just take this bread. You just think about this as being the body of Jesus and a contact point of faith and personal intimate. And if maybe for the first time you would just look at this bread and just say out of your heart, wow, you really do love me. I have nothing to make up for. I'm not passing a test today. You passed the test for me. You gave me a passing grade. I'm already in. You value my life or you wouldn't have gave yours. There's another side of this that I practice a lot. I look at this bread and say, Lord, if you gave your life, surely I'll give mine. If you were willing to die for righteousness sake, then I would say I'm willing to die the best I understand. Now, I know your disciples said that when they were given the chance, they didn't. But help me fulfill that desire because in my heart, I want to give my life for you. Not that I need to go out and be martyred. I just want to be surrendered. And if you gave everything, I want to know what it means to give everything. And if you gave your body, I say, I give you mine. Because to find your life is to lose it, but to lose it for your sake is to find it. So continue to grow me in these truths. There's some simple examples, guys. Wrap faith right around your own heart right now. And around that bread you're holding and talk to him, please. Right now, just talk to him. Commune with him. Thank him for what the body's meaning to you right now. It could be one line. It could be four lines. It could be two aspects. It could be three. Just be real and do this right now from the heart. And catch a vision for how powerful this can be in your personal life. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good. Okay, guys. Why don't you just hold that up just a little bit in front of you. We're going to do this together. Father, as the body right now of Christ, we honor you and we take this bread. We've personally exchanged our heart with you and now corporately we're saying we are the body of Christ. You paid to redeem us, to make us an army, to make us an expression of you in the earth and and wherever we are is our mission field and our sphere of influence is amazing and combined... Spheres of influence right now. Our spheres of influence combined. If we would multiply this room and the sphere of influence, we are touching lots of people through the day with just passing by, being in the midst of and in our circle of life. And God, we thank you for the honor of this revelation being so bright in our lives that it has to make a difference right where we are. So we give ourselves to you in the best way we understand as you gave yourself for the same cause and for righteousness sake and for love's sake and for the name of almighty God's sake. We receive this bread and say we receive your love, your forgiveness, your mercy and we understand we're one with you and nothing can break this covenant because it was made by you. In Jesus' name. Take that by faith, please. Ooh, that is good. Wow. Isn't that good? You were right. Isn't he sweet? Mm. Look, he took the cup and he passed it, and it was the blood of his covenant. I just want you to understand that Jesus never sinned. He was made to be sin. His blood was holy and spotless. So his blood is holy and spotless on the mercy seat in heaven, not the one Moses and those guys made, the replica Jesus went into heaven, Hebrews 9, put his own blood, not the blood of bulls and goats, his own blood. It says the blood of bulls and goats can't remove sin, but the blood of Jesus can. It says the blood of bulls and goats can't take the consciousness of sin away, but the blood of Jesus can. So when you take this cup, what I want you to understand is it's never about you trying harder. It's about you believing right. See, believing right will produce fruit in your life without you trying harder. Like you don't wake up and try not to sin. You wake up and be received and enjoy being his and be accepted. 
You don't wake up and try not to sin. You wake up and enjoy being right in his sight. And Romans 6 teaches, if you present yourself as a member unto righteousness, it'll produce, righteousness itself will produce holiness in your life. All of a sudden, you're living holy without biting your lip trying to be. So I guess all glory would go to God and you'd never get proud. You'd just stay broken and humble because he's amazing. Because he's the one that made me this way. He's the one that put these things in me. Yay. This blood is the blood of the new covenant. It speaks better things. You're not judged for where you've been. You're judged for where he's been. And you can't change where you've been, but who you are can change. And that's called a gift. So let your heart be humble today and understand that this blood redeems you and buys you back and brings you back to original value as if you've never sinned and causes you to stand before him holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. Through Jesus, you have access to God. Do you get it? So if you've been feeling guilty, you've been feeling condemned, if you did something you knew you weren't supposed to do and you did it anyway, and you've cried and you've wept and you can't stop thinking about it, today's the day to stop. Today's the day to say, you know what? God has seen my heart. Surely I've been sorry. And if I could go back and do it over, I would, but I can't. So truly I've changed. And I thank you for this blood, the blood of Jesus that speaks over me. Better things. I'm not judged. I'm not condemned. I'm not less than. I'm your child and you're doing a work in me. Keep growing me up into you in all things. Guys, this is communion. You can activate your heart every day. I would encourage you to receive communion every day and let your own words replace mine and let your own heart activate and let the knowings of God start to grow right here. Amen? Amen. Let's hold this cup up and acknowledge covenant. We're in covenant with him. You have to understand that God made a covenant through his son as a man. You can't break the covenant. You can break fellowship with it. You can step out of the covenant. The covenant is unbreakable. It is forever between God and his son. And you enter into the covenant with God through his son. You can break fellowship. You can walk out of fellowship with God. Or you can step in through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So, Father, we hold up this cup and we thank you for the blood of your son. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came and you shed your blood. It was your blood that redeems us. It's your blood that speaks better things. It's your blood that shows us that we do have value, purpose, and potential in you. And that you would come and shed your innocent blood to redeem guilty people shows me the power of love and that love sees past performance and love sees past present day. I thank you that you were able to look past what we looked like and appeared to be because you knew what we were from the beginning. Let our eyes go deeper and let us see deeper, Lord God. Let us not just be fault finders and first impression people. Let us learn to live with righteous judgment and see people for what they're created to be and not what they're failing in. Teach us to never let go and to never give up. Let us never throw anyone away, God, but let the redeeming power of this cross burn in our hearts, through our lives, and in the lives of others. As we take this cup, we just say we're committed, we're in, and we just thank you that you would love us this much. And Father, as just overseeing this and leading this session, I just ask this one thing, that we in this room would know your love, enjoy your love, and express your love like never before, in Jesus' name. Go ahead. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord God. Pastor Kurt.